My name, as uh, Joe said, my name is Chris Lawton. I work for Farm Credit East. Um, before that, I uh, came from a nursery greenhouse background. My family had a um, nursery greenhouse business in eastern Massachusetts, not far from Boston. And um, I have an undergraduate degree in horticulture, and I worked for my dad for 12 years running our family business, and then my dad sold the company. Um, part of his retirement plan was um, using the equity in the business to fund his retirement. So um, I went to business school and then joined Farm Credit East. Um, so I'm going to talk about benchmarking, and benchmarking ties in very well with what Rick talked about this morning, where um, he talked about the importance of using numbers, and we're going to revisit some of the things that he talked about. And one of the, thing, the issues is where you get those numbers from. Uh, you know, how do you, if, you're, if you haven't, for example, raised turkeys yourself in the past, how do you know what it's going to cost to raise a turkey? Well, one way to learn that is by looking at a benchmark of a similar industry. It gives you an idea of what's possible. Um, so first, let me begin by talking about Farm Credit East just to, you know, very briefly. For those of you that aren't familiar with us, we're a financial services cooperative. We're similar in many respects to a commercial bank, except that we're owned by the farmers we finance. Um, and we provide things like loans, leases, tax preparation, that kind of thing. Um, but moving on to benchmarking. Benchmarking is basically, it's just comparing your results to a reference. And a reference could be your own farm over time. That's perhaps, perhaps even the most important f form of benchmarking. I mean, Rick, when you're doing next year's budget, you look at what you did the prior year probably, and you know, maybe we can get 10% better on this, or maybe we can save, you know, shave 5% better on our costs or whatever else, but you're, what you did in the past is the best indicator of what you're going to be able to do in the future. So benchmarking doesn't have to be going to an outside reference. It can be looking at yourself over time. Um, it can be looking at peer businesses in your industry. So what are other, if I'm in the greenhouse business, what are other greenhouses doing for expenses and revenues? It could be different kinds of businesses. Um, I know one um, garden center business that was contemplating opening up a second garden center location, a second retail location from their main one. And they actually looked at some benchmarks of different industries and they looked at their management capacity and their their staff capacity and what it would entail to staff a second location and everything else, they decided to open up a, um, a self-storage place in that second location, uh, totally outside the box of what, they, what their main business was, but they looked at the returns and the, the inputs that it took to run a, a retail store and they decided to just shift to a completely different business model for their second location. Um, and it can be different kinds of investments. You could look at what if I just hang it all up and put this into a mutual fund, you know, what, what is my, you know, that's another way of benchmarking is, uh, and that's the way like investors are going to look at uh, businesses. If you're, a lot of um, companies are going into this vertical farming and uh, hydroponic greenhouses and things like that, and a lot of them are running on investor money. And these investors are, for the most part, not necessarily vested in agriculture. They're looking at what is my return going to be if I invest in your potential venture compared to if I invest in stock markets or something else and you're going to have to show that you can beat that return if you want to attract outside investor money. So benchmarking can be looking at a lot of different, but it's all about comparing yourself to some kind of standard. So uh, in this case I'm going to focus on this one, peer businesses in your industry, because that's what um, Farm Credit East benchmarks primarily, fo primarily focus on, is we group businesses that are comparable in different industries and produce sort of consolidated financial statements that can be used for a business to compare themselves against their peers. So how can I use a benchmark? What's the benefit? Why even bother? So a benchmark can help reality check budgets. So in Rick's presentation, he talked about building a budget from the bottom up and looking at uh, his costs, looking at what he can sell things for, that kind of thing. And he had that reality check of what is the neighbor selling his turkeys for. If the neighbor is selling turkeys for three twenty dollars a pound and you think you're going to get $4, that may be possible, but how am I going to get there? What's going to be my selling point, to my value proposition to the customer? And that three twenty dollars was his reality check. And he he'd got that from sort of a benchmark by looking at what his neighbor is charging. You can also get that by looking at an actual financial benchmark and see what are other businesses in that industry achieving 
And do I think I can do better than them? And if so, how? Um, so it shows what's really achievable. If you're thinking of a startup business, you know, look at some, try if you can, get some benchmarks in that industry and see what other businesses in that industry are, are really accomplishing. And benchmarks are typically for mature businesses. So if, if a mature business in your industry, the industry you want to go into, is getting only 3% return on their investment and you think you're going to get 10, well, how are you going to get there? So it's a reality check of, of that. Um, it can show areas where you're doing well and show areas where you're, there's room for improvement. We'll look at some line items of actual benchmarks and you can compare your own numbers to the benchmark numbers and see, okay, well, my labor is good, but my insurance costs are way out of line. So, you know, why might that be the case? Um, and remember that industry benchmarks are typically an average, although sometimes um, Benchmarks will use the median as well, and we'll talk about the difference between those two numbers and why they matter. Um, but typically, half do better and half do worse. So um, if you're looking at a benchmark, it's certainly not a guarantee that you're going to get those same results. You may do better, you may do worse. Uh, and it's also achievable to beat the benchmark, and that really ideally should be your goal. The average is really just the top of the bottom. Um, but it's important to think about, well, how are you going to get to do better than most of these people because people, the established businesses in, the, in, a, in any benchmark, the people aren't stupid. They're, you know, they've been running the business for a while and they've been managed, you know, they're trying to achieve the best results they can. So if you're gonna beat them, you need to think about, okay, what am I gonna do that's different or better or how am I gonna, you know, um, go beyond what the average results in the industry are. So why don't we look at a few case studies here so benchmarks are available from a number of sources. Um, not to toot our own horn, but, but Farm Credit East is, is probably a pretty good source for a lot of industry benchmarks, the industries that we do benchmark. Um, we make them available on request free of charge. We do 10 different industries in the Northeast, and they're good because they're Northeast based. So our territory is New England, New York, and New Jersey. So a lot of benchmarks, you can get benchmarks from USDA and university extensions as well. Um, but they tend to be more focused on Midwest or West Coast, where the economics and the scale of things are often quite a bit different. Um, but you can get them from a number of sources. So I'll start with looking at dairy because that's our, by far our most robust benchmark. And it's also a, a pretty good one to do. I don't know if any of you are interested in dairy or not, but we'll just walk through the exercise for the sake of it. Um, but dairy industries tend, dairy businesses tend to be fairly comparable to each other. A, you know, one 250 cow dairy is often very similar to another 250 cow dairy in that their, their inputs are probably somewhat similar. They're both producing milk. They're both getting pretty close to the same price, that kind of thing. It's a lot harder with when you're trying to benchmark like retail businesses or diversified farms or things like that because you have more variability within your, your benchmarks. So that's something to consider. But if we look at dairy, uh, you can see, for example, in our uh, our benchmark, this one has three, almost 350 farms, so it's a very robust benchmark. It has a lot of different farms in it. But notice the, um, we have gross sales, and this is cat classified in the way the farms classify it, but they all come down to basically 100% of the, the gross income. We, we break it down by percent of sales, and we try to, for most of our benchmarks, we try to have a, an industry measure. In the case of dairy, it's typically the number of cows, milking cows in the herd. Um, for a greenhouse, it might be the number of square feet. For a retail business, it might be square footage of retail store. Um, for a corn grower, it would be per acre typically. That allows you to compare across sizes. So if a benchmark is, um, if you want to grow hay and the, the hay benchmark is 375 acres and you're only at 100, your numbers are going to be substantially different from what the benchmark says. But if you look at a per unit basis, you can get more comparison across sizes. Um, so if we scroll down on the page, notice that we classify expenses the same way that Rick did. So Rick called it cost of goods sold. Here we're referring to variable expenses, but it's, there are two terms for the same thing. These are basically the costs that are direct inputs into the product produced. So variable expenses are things that are going, in this case, directly into the milk that's being produced by that farm. And so we're looking at Typically in a dairy farm, the, um, oh, whoops, here's my laser. 
Uh, feed and labor are by far the biggest expenses in the whole thing. For most farms, labor is your number one or number two expenses. Uh, number, uh, expense, rather. Labor will kill you every time <laughs> in any kind of agricultural business, especially at a small scale. Um, it's one thing that's important to note is that it's important to use labor efficiently. One of the things that we notice in the, uh, the dairy benchmark when we drill into the numbers is that the farms that get the most out of their labor in terms of efficiency, get the best return, are not necessarily the ones paying their labor the least. Um, so it's not just a, fa a matter of finding the absolute cheapest guy, who am I gonna get that's gonna work for minimum wage. Um, you know, obviously the fact that how much you pay people is a factor, but we find that typically the ones that are getting the most efficiency out of their labor are not necessarily the ones paying the, the least. They're obvious, they're investing in their employees, they're getting more out of them, they're getting better people. Um, so that's just kind of an aside. But basically, this gives you a chance, if you are a dairy, you can look across and see, okay, what am I spending per, per cow on feed? Am I close to that? Am I above that? Am I below that? And it's okay if, you're, if you don't match or beat what the benchmark is, but you want to think about why. So am I spending more than this $1,500 on feed per cow? And if so, that may be okay, but am I getting above, above average productivity out of my cows? If I'm not, if I'm getting average or below average productivity, but I'm spending more on feed, why, why am I doing that? What's, where am I going off the rails? Um, so this is just an example of some different kinds of expenses that are all variable expenses. If we scroll down in the, in the um, financial statement, this is an income statement, if we scroll down, we then get to the total variable expenses, we get to the gross margin. In the case of dairy, it's, at least this is for last year, so prices were not great. So their gross margin was not great. Um, but that's what they achieved in the, in the dairy industry last year for our, in, uh, an average dairy farm. Then we get into fixed expenses. And as Rick said, the, one of the things that's important to consider is your variable and your fixed expenses because they behave differently. Fixed expenses are those expenses that are um, your overhead. They're things that do not typically change directly with your productivity. So, uh, or when they change, they change in steps. If you invest in a bigger facility or something, then your, your overhead, your fixed expenses go up in, by a chunk. Um, but if I added 10 cows, these things probably aren't going to change. If I push my, push my cows harder by feeding them more and get some more milk out of them, these, my, my rent for the land that I'm renting is not going to change. So that's why they're categorized differently, because they behave differently. Your fixed expenses are, thing, are often things that you can influence by expanding production. You can tend to dilute fixed expenses to a certain extent. The caveat to that is that you'd want to optimize the capacity of the facility you have. So if you wanted to, say, double your size, these fixed expenses wouldn't stay the same. You'd have to make major investments in facilities, and your fixed expenses would change by some, some amount. But if you can optimize the facility you have, you can get the most out of your fixed expenses, so that, that will dilute them as a percent of sales. Your variable expenses, on the other hand, your direct inputs, if you're, say, a greenhouse, things like your uh, cost of, of seeds or young plants, cost of uh, hanging baskets, your media that you're putting into them, your labor, those things tend to, if you add another 100 hanging baskets, you're going to have 100 more baskets to buy, 100 more uh, you know, units of, of media to put in those baskets. All those things are going to tend to grow proportionately. The message from that is that if, you're, if you have a variable cost problem, it's hard to grow out of that unless you're going to achieve some kind of efficiency you didn't get before. So if you're a dairy farm in this case and your gross margin isn't what you want, you need to look at your inputs, but adding more cows is not necessarily gonna improve this number because those expenses are just gonna rise at the same rate of your as you're increasing your production. So that's one of the reasons why we look at variable and fixed expenses differently. But one of the other things that's important in a benchmark is it itemizes a lot of different expenses oftentimes if, you, if it's a, an income statement benchmark like this one is. And you, know, you can look at all your different things and say, geez, you know, did I think about 
my utility cost when I was doing my budget? Did I think about all these different things and make sure you're not kind of missing anything? Um, so we can see that their gross margin was, was fairly low, lower than target because prices were low and they did the best they could last, you know, last year. Um, this is a case where looking at a five-year average would be um, advised because of the volatility in, in top-line milk price. Um, the overhead was 24%, which is kind of in line with what Rick recommended. The net margin was 3.1%, so not great, but still positive. So, and then here's another thing where we looked at non-farm income and family living, and then what the farm had at the very end of the day, what that family had for revenue. And the only reason I put this in there is that non-farm income is still important even in a lot of established farm businesses. So it's important to think, especially if you're beginning a farm, um, there's certainly nothing wrong with having some off-farm income to help buffer your, your farm enterprise. Like for example, Rick has his day job as being a consultant for Farm Credit East and isn't relying exclusively on the revenue from the turkeys. Um, so even with a lot of established farm businesses, it's important to um, consider that off-farm income Oftentimes, it's a spouse's job um, can be very important. Then we get into ratios. And what, it's not important to know every single one of these. As Rick said, there's a, a point of diminishing returns. I really like the, the five-piece toolbox that he gave and the five, you know, everything was five. Um, that's a really good way. This, this can be a little overwhelming, but some of these can have some importance if you, if you want to really drill down into your numbers. So when we get into um, some of the ratios, this can show you how useful some of the benchmarks can be in terms of drilling down some of the different costs, costs that are involved, in this case, dairy. Um, they can give you some examples of what the average farm in the industry is achieving. And it gives you a good, like I said, a good reality check and a good handle as far as what your results are. If you wanted to go into dairy, you might be able to use these numbers as a realistic projection of what's, you know, what you might get. So moving on into cash field crops, what we call cash field crops, which is things like corn, uh, soybeans, wheat, hay, uh, that kind of thing. My, our samples drop quite a bit once we get out of dairy, and we're, we're working on changing the format of our benchmark to get those numbers up again. But uh, in any case, we have 39 farms, so it's still a, a reasonable cross slice of a bunch of different um, field crop farms. And again, we, we get the um, business income. In this case, these farms are fairly large, but we can look at it on a, on a per total tillable acre is basically the, the cultivated acres that the farm has. And so we break that down and that allows you to compare across, across sizes as well as the uh, percent of sales. But we look at, this is, you know, this gives you an idea of what you can expect to spend on some of these uh, categories and what other farms are are spending. So if you think that um, you know you want to spend a lot more money on fertilizer and lime than what the average benchmark farm is spending, well maybe that's you know if you want to do that, think about where your return is going to come from and is that really advisable? That's probably as Rick pointed out at the very first slide that he had, getting beyond the um, optimum return level, getting into the the point at which your returns start to diminish. So again, this is just the same format as what we saw before. So we have different um, expense line items going down, different fixed expenses and their percentages. Here we can see that the, uh, the gross margins are closer to what Rick suggested as a, a goal for the average farm. Um, fixed expenses or overhead is higher. That tends to be the case. These things tend to vary by industry. So if you're in a very labor intensive industry, if you're in a vegetable, if you want to grow vegetables, for example, your labor is going to be way, way higher than this guy who's doing hay. Um, so that's, that's one reason why using an industry specific benchmark can be important. Um, labor tends to be pretty low in a mechanized sector like field crops. Um, but fixed expenses tend to be higher mostly because of this number right here, depreciation. Fixed row crops tend to have a lot of equipment, be very mechanized. They're not using a lot of labor. 
but they're using a lot of machinery, and so that's influencing their, how their um, income statement looks. And then again, we just have the final earnings analysis. And in this case, the benchmark lost money. That doesn't mean that everyone's losing money, but a significant number of the people in this slice of, um, of the benchmark didn't make money last year. So that's, again, another reason why it's good to look at multiple years um, and consider that half the farms do do better. So just because um, a significant number didn't make money, it doesn't mean it's not, not possible. Um, and then again, we get into some of the same ratios. Um, not every one of these is important to totally understand completely, but they can be useful if you're comparing certain aspects of your business to the, the benchmark. Um, I'm going to tab through the orchard benchmark unless there's specific interest in orchards. Um, I just I did several different industries just so we could have a cross section of of industries. Here's a greenhouse benchmark just to give you a different format. Um, this is what we're moving to at Farm Credit East, which is sort of an abbreviated benchmark, but we have a much bigger sample. We went from about 25 farms in our itemized benchmark to almost 80 in this one. And here we talk about average and median. Um, this is getting a little wonky in terms of math, but basically average is if Bill Gates walks into a room, the average income in that room just went through the roof. But that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone in the room is better off. That just means that you're averaging in Bill Gates' income with everyone else in the room. So the average is heavily influenced typically by a small number of very large producers in any industry. The median, if Bill Gates walks into that room again, the median income wouldn't really change because the median is the number of, if you have 10 producers, the median would be what number five is getting. So it's not necessarily, even if the, the top producer is, has millions and millions of dollars in revenue, it's, the, it's that middle number basically of, of samples so the median tends to be lower in, in value than the average because it's not as influenced by um, a few large producers. So that's just, you know, again, it's getting into some, some detail there, but um, that just explains to you why they're different and why you would, might be concerned more about one than the other. Um, if you're a smaller producer, you're probably gonna be more concerned about the median because that's um, probably more realistic. Um, in this case, the median farm income in greenhouse was, was 1.2 million, whereas the average was 4.3 million. That's because in that benchmark, there's probably a few greenhouses that are like 10 million plus, and that pulled that average way up. Um, but in, and then we broke down into profit quartiles, just like Rick showed for dairy. It's interesting that the top profit quartile is not the one that made the most money, on the top line at least. Um, without going into specific names, um, one of the reasons is because one of those $10 million greenhouses that's in this benchmark lost a lot of money. <laughs> so they're, uh, they're pulling up this average for the bottom and the net farm income for the, actually the highest sales category was negative because that being bigger doesn't necessarily mean better. Better is better, not, not always bigger is better. Yeah, John. They're de defined by um, net income as a percent of sales. Okay. So, okay. Makes sense. so yeah, we looked at uh, total farm income, total farm expenses, and net farm income. And in this case, you can see the absolute dollars, the second quartile was a little higher than the first quartile. Yeah. They made 543,000 instead of 512,000. So they're actually making more absolute dollars, but their percent of the sales that they made are substantially less because they're selling they're working a lot harder to make that money. They're selling $4 million to make 543,000 where this, the top quartile is making almost the same money at half the volume. So um, this is just an example of, um, this, this shows you a range of results that you can get in the same industry. Um, and that's in, an important aspect of um, some benchmarks in that they'll show you a range of perfect quartiles because they'll, you know, Ideally, you'd want to aspire to be up in this top profit quartile. 
but you know, consider that the, the median is getting only this. So if you want to exceed that, you're going to have to do something special that the average guy is not doing. Um, and here we look at um, balance sheet items, their assets and liabilities and their net worth. And then their, the interest expense goes into determining uh, return on assets. So we're looking at uh, return on assets and return on equity. Return on assets is the profit that's earned uh, as a percent of all the assets that that company owns. Um, ideally, you'd want the, number, the percent to be as large as possible. Um, so if you have a large company that's not making a lot of money, their return on assets is going to be very low. One of the, things, one of the reasons return on assets is useful is because it cuts across sizes. So you can have a small business that's really profitable as a percent of your a assets or your percent of your income. Um, and it, sh it allows you to target and achieve uh, good results even across sizes, whether you're small or large or that kind of thing. Return on equity is basically the same measure, but it's just on the amount that you personally have invested in your business. So it takes out what other people, usually banks, have loaned you. And so it's looking at, and that's usually uh, magnified, either positive or negative, from return on assets because it's, it's taking out the financed equity in the business. And so leverage, it's called leverage, and it's called leverage for a reason because it, it, it typically, mag, you know, if your business is profitable and you borrow some money and expand, you're likely going to earn more money on the investment that you have in that business. But if things go south and you lose money, your personal loss is likely to be more extreme as well. So that's one of the, the risks that's involved in, in borrowing money. Um, but here I put in this, this one because I wanted to show a different format for, um, for a benchmark. Um, another ratio that's important to look at is current ratio. This is basically just the current assets divided by the current liabilities of a business. It's a solvency ratio, so it gives you an idea of um, can my business pay its bills? It's your cash, your inventory, anything that's going to be converted into cash within typically a year. And your current liabilities are things like your um, current portion of your debts, uh, things that you're going to have to pay back, your accounts payable, the things that you owe to trade uh, vendors, anything that you have that you currently owe. And so you want it, basically you really want it to be above one because if, if it's one, then that means your current assets are equal to your current liabilities, meaning that your whatever you have in cash and things similar to cash are spoken for 100% by what you owe. If it exceeds one, that's good. That means that you have more liquidity, you have more cash available than what you actually owe. If it's below one, then you're in trouble because you're going you're gonna to struggle to pay your bills. So we can I see like, that. I like to think of that uh, current ratio as the, the, the gauge on your air tank. Yes, there you go. You, you're going to be heading for underwater. Do I have much air in the tank? Look at the top off of it, it's 5.4. Yeah, so these guys are very comfortable. They have, they have a nice big air tank. They more than five, five times in cash and inventory compared to what they actually owe creditors. You can see that this slides down as we get into the bottom profitability where this guy only has, still solvent, but only has 1.6 times what he actually owes creditors. So if you took out, if you, if he had to pay all this stuff, this is his current liabilities, all, everything that he, he owes that he's going to have to pay back. If you took, took this out right away, if this all came due today and he had to pay it out of his current assets, he'd have not a lot left. Whereas... This person, even though we're talking smaller numbers, is a lot more comfortable. Um, just a few other ratios that I put in here. Gross farm income as a percent of total assets. This is interesting. This shows that this farm is actually, these farms right here on the, the lower profit are actually producing more top line revenue as a percent of their, the money that's invested in their business than these guys are. So why aren't they more profitable? They're getting more top line in the door. It's what Rick said. They're, they're, they've gotten more top line revenue, but they've done that at the expense of not being as efficient, 
perhaps they're, they're charging lower prices. Um, for example, I can tell you that one of the bottom 25% greenhouse suppliers, uh, greenhouse companies that's in that is a supplier to Walmart. So they're selling their product at a much more narrow margin than this guy is who's a smaller, well, I mean, they're, they're multiple in each category, but these people tend to be smaller um, and more direct to retail, so they're getting more margin in their product. So these um, gross farm income numbers, they're, getting, they're doing huge volumes, but they're making pennies on each, on each unit that they're selling. So that shows that getting top line revenue can be seductive in terms of it's, um, it can be very appealing to take on a big client perhaps or that kind of thing, but you need to think about what's this gonna do to my margins if you take 10% off your selling price, that doesn't take 10% off your profits. That takes 10% off of your gross margin, which is gonna trickle down and that could cut your profits by like a third, depending on how your profit margin is. Because every dollar that you take out of revenue is gonna trickle down through your income statement. And that, that, that cut in price can ma be magnified as you go down. Um, here we have depreciation, which is basically a function of their investment in equipment. Um, and then here we have debt coverage. And again, this is another measure of liquidity. This is how comfortable they are in covering their debt. So basically what this does is it takes the, the current portion of their long-term debt and it divides it by their income. So this, this, this category is earning way beyond what they actually own in debt pay owe in debt payments, whereas this company is going to struggle to meet them this year, or these companies, rather. So here I just wanted to show you some other examples of benchmarks that are out there. Um, no offense to UConn, but UConn doesn't really do a lot of benchmarks. But um, if you just go on and Google, your industry benchmarks or your industry cost of production. Cost of production is basically another, it's, it's another way of looking at a benchmark. It's doing um, the typical cost of an industry, which is a benchmark in and of itself. But uh, so in this case, Iowa State University has a um, one and, and here they have mixed vegetables, CSA model, non-CSA model, individual fruits, organic row crops, pasture, poultry, Rick. Um, high tunnel mixed vegetables, high tunnel single crops. So they have some different, um, what you might call non-traditional or small business direct to consumer um, benchmarks. They're not just corn and soybeans, um, although you can get that as well. Um, and there's other, that's just one example of a, um, of a university extension that has that. There are other ones out there as well if you just go on you know, Google and look at um, you know, in a specific industry and benchmarks. Um, and then USDA, the Economic Research Service, um, has, and again, they refer to it as cost of production forecasts, but that's, a, that's another type of benchmark. What they're trying to do is look at what are the costs of producing a given commodity. So in this case, they're looking at what were the costs of corn, and you can look at that, and they often give you a per acre amount. Um, typically, they're very Midwest, larger scale focused, so you'd want to take that with a grain of salt if you're comparing it to Connecticut results. But it gives you at least some basis for considering, okay, what's it going to cost me to make this particular product? So, and they, these tend to be focused on the major um, agricultural commodity crops, but that's just another resource out there. So those are some case studies where I walked you through and we, we talked about a lot of detail on some individual benchmarks. And the, the details are not important as much as what I talked about why you'd want to look at those things. Um, so that brings us to next steps. What's the, what does this all lead to? So benchmarks can be used to track progress. Like one of the things that Rick said is that he, actually I don't know if he mentioned this before his session or when talking to me or if it was part of his session, but he says that he, he rates the weather on every retail weekend on a one to 10 scale and puts that in his uh, QuickBooks results. And so he'll, say, okay, well, I did $1,000 in sales this weekend, and the weather was a 10, meaning it was 10 out of 10. It was a great, great sales weekend, sunny weather. Um, if we had a downpour, that might be a 1 out of 10, 
and that's going to typically affect his sales. So he's tracking his progress from one year to the next, but he's putting in the caveat of what the weather was. And that my father used to do that in, the, in our greenhouse business, where we'd look at, he used to say that a rainy Mother's Day costs us $10,000 because that's typically what he would see in lost sales and the difference between a sunny, a sunny Mother's Day and a rainy Mother's Day on sales that never came back. Um, so benchmarks can be used to track progress if you look at your performance over time and compare it to a key influencer like weather. Um, you can look for improvement areas by looking at benchmarks areas, like I said, where you're doing well, areas where you're doing poorly, and you can check assumptions. If you want to do a new business venture, something that John's going to talk about a little bit later on, um, it's important to think about, okay, what can I expect out of this new, new business venture? If, I, if, if Rick wanted to add uh, pasture chickens to his business, he might want to look at a, 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 chick a pasture chicken benchmark if he can find one. Okay. And see, okay, well, what's realistic to achieve in this, in this industry? You know, and, and again, maybe you know, he's probably better than average, so maybe he can exceed the benchmark results, but it's important to think about why. You know, in business, if you're, there's two ways to go. If you're, if you're a commodity producer, typically the advantage of that is that um, your buyer will take all you produce. You don't know what price you're gonna get, but if you're growing corn and selling it to, to a grain elevator, they're not going to say, oh, I'm only going to buy, well, usually, they're not going to say, I'm only going to buy 1,000 bushels, even if you have 10,000 to sell. They'll, they'll take whatever you have, but you get the market price. So that's the advantage to being a commodity producer is you don't have to worry necessarily about your sales and marketing efforts quite as much. And you, and you have some savings on that end because you don't necessarily have to advertise, uh, you know, buy my corn, you know, you just truck it to the elevator. But if you're a retail business, you have to convince the consumer to buy your specific product as opposed to someone else's. And there's, two, there's a couple of key things there. One is it's important to be better, cheaper, or different. Have some kind of hook that's going to get the consumer to come to you. If you're not one of those three, then you're going to struggle to get sales. Um, better is a great place to play. Different is a great place to play. Cheaper is a very dangerous place to play because unless you have some kind of production um, skill that, is, that way exceeds what the industry has, and, and you can find that out based on your benchmarks, unless you think you're gonna beat the, the efficiency of the average business, it's gonna be harder for you to undercut everyone on price. Um, it can be a way to build business, and you can you know, pay for that in terms of margin to get people in the door, but, but a much better places to play are by being diff different in some way, differentiating yourself, or, or trying to be better than the, than the average. Those are better ways to get customers in the door. Um, another thing to consider with your um, sales and marketing is, um, yeah, I mentioned the, the, the differentiation aspect. That's a really key one. But you need to think about your shrink as well. Shrink is basically all product that's made or produced but not sold. So mortality is a form of shrink. Um, in a retail business, a, probably one of the most important forms of shrink is product that you ended up not selling. The turkeys that you had left over after Thanksgiving. Um, in, the, in the case of turkeys, you can still, you, they still have some value in that people will, some people will still buy turkeys after Thanksgiving. Yeah, there you go. But if you're selling Christmas trees, poinsettias, uh, pumpkins, I mean, to some extent, for Halloween, um, the day after the holiday, those have almost no value. So if you are, you know, you can do your pencil out your math and everything else and look at your margin and your, you know, your five line income statement and all that other stuff. But if you have, say, 20% unsold product, then you probably did it all for nothing. So that's an important thing to consider. You know, shrink is very, shrink will kill you just as much as labor when it comes to uh, agriculture, especially if, especially if you're in a retail setting. Um, so I hope that that basically wraps up what I was gonna talk about. I hope that that was um, at least somewhat useful to you. Um, if there's any questions that anyone has or they wanna talk about a specific venture that you're thinking of, yeah. Chris, what percentage of people who come to you for credit have gone through benchmarking in addition to having a business plan? 
extremely few. <laughs> um, no, it's um, it's very underused, to be honest. The there, there's kind of two categories of people that, uh, or two categor categories of, of ways that people borrow money. One is typically they want to do some kind of expansion or make some kind of investment or buy some kind of equipment, and they're just going to finance it out of their existing profitability. So if I'm a dairy farm, I made fifty thousand dollars last year. Um, I need to borrow. $20,000 for a new tractor. We'll look at that, see that they can cash flow the money. We don't really ask the question of, is this the best investment for your business? You know, is this tractor going to return on, the, on its investment? We kind of leave that up to the farmer to decide what his goals are and priorities are, and maybe he just likes new tractors, and that's fine, you know, as long as he can afford it. Um, but, you know, we'll just basically look at their repayment capacity and, you know, stamp, you're good to go. Um, the other main category are people that come in with business plans that have, typically they'll have some amount of down payment, some collateral, but there's still a leap of faith in terms of, uh, that's required in terms of the financing where it's contingent on the business making money down the road, and that's a much more scrutinized um, application. And um, that's where, you know, all of those five C's come in. We don't just, you know, if they can't necessarily just cash flow it out of their current uh, operations and that's a harder thing to finance but um, that's where we will start to look for things like business plans you know have things been budgeted out um, can the payments be cash flowed out of you know the the return on the the um, the investment that kind of thing at farm credit we have a very comprehensive dairy benchmark that's extremely comprehensive people have to pay three thousand dollars to be a part of it per year yeah, we have one that goes even beyond the one I showed you that goes way into production metrics like specific components of feed and, um, you know, really drills down into the management. We get a very comprehensive report, and our credit department loves it. In fact, I know farms who have had their interest rate here, which is risk-based, reduced because they're a part of that benchmark and they have such comprehensive cost analysis compared to industry standards. Don? They, they pay 3000 to get the report, a very comprehensive, customized report to the business. <clears throat> and then they bring it to their lender, and they say, wow, this is really helping yeah. us. So you better analyze how you're doing in the industry. And I've seen businesses get an interest rate reduction that more than pays a $3,000 fee just because the lender viewed it as lower risk. Yeah, or, or they'll, they'll look at, you know, one of the things that I – sometimes say if people are questioning the cost of something like that, is I'll say, well, think about doing one thing differently on your, in your business. If you took that, you know, just one thing, if you took that benchmark and found, you know, one line item where you were out of whack, and particularly in the variable side where that's multiplied by all your production units, you know, all your cows or all your square feet or that kind of thing, you know, if you could, if you're growing 10,000 hanging baskets a year and you can save 50 cents per, per unit, Somehow, you know, that's going to get you $5,000, right? 50000 no, wait, $5,000 right there if you're selling 10,000 hanging baskets. Um, so, you know, I'll say if you can do one thing differently, then you've paid for your, yeah, you know, I, your investment. I actually had clients who, a very large dairy farm, doing the benchmark and saw that their feed costs were higher than they should have been, and they thought it was, well, feed prices have gone up. That's why our feed costs are so high. So when they saw the how they compared to their peers, they actually saved eight hundred thousand dollars in one year on feed by revisiting their feeding protocols. And you know, for a three thousand dollar benchmark investment, that was probably the most extreme example. But benchmarks are huge in testing your cost of production relative to others. And sometimes it's high for a reason, and there's nothing you can do about it. But sometimes there's opportunities found that tr that create tremendous benefits. Yeah. Yep. So good at doing different benchmark variability. Yep. And looking at the um, different changes in your business for that one line item. Yeah. And I love the four quantities because the farmers can really relate to the, those four different quantities. Yeah, what she's referring to is called partial budgeting. And that's a way to evaluate an investment that you might make in your farm. 
like let's say you're, I, I hate to just only use dairy as an example because we, we, we go to it too much, but let's say for the sake of argument that you are a dairy farm and you're uh, growing corn silage to feed your farm and you pay a custom operator to chop that for you and you're considering buying your own chopper. So you'd look at the four quadrants, you, you know, you just take a piece of paper drawn in, for, in force and you look at, okay, what uh, earnings am I going to increase for, by buying this equipment? What earnings might decrease by buying this equipment? Usually they don't decrease by buying an additional piece of equipment, but sometimes they could if you change your operation or something. And then what costs are going to increase and what costs are going to decrease? And usually the cost increase decrease is the biggest impact of a piece of equipment. So you could look at, well, I'm going to add all these dirty five costs. So that $100,000 chopper is going to cost me, you know, $30,000, $40,000 a year in additional overhead. But I'm going to save all the custom application fees that I was paying the other guy to do for me. Plus there's some other intangibles, like I can get it done when I want it. Um, I don't have to rely on this other guy to do it, blah, blah, blah. So you, you can weigh all those factors into your decision, and that's an important way to, to evaluate a decision because the reality is in that in really almost any business, including agriculture, is that there's never enough money to do all the things that you want to do. So, you know, you, you might have a business where, geez, you know, we need a new tractor, but we also need to fix the barn. You know, wouldn't it be great if we could get, um, you know, a new retail store? Um, we, I'd like to get a point of sale system, you know, all these other things. We need to hire an additional marketing person. You know, you can do those, um, those partial budgets. You can even do it for hiring, uh, hiring a person. You know, you, in that case, you'd have a revenue impact more. Um, you know, what additional revenue might this additional person bring in versus what they're going to cost? Um, and you can use that to make priorities in terms of where you're going to invest um, because there's never, you can never do it all at once at least. Yeah. Huh. It's starting to perk up a little bit. I'm like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah. So, as, as far as business prospects, I'm the lead on developing, uh, co developing the food core in Springfield, Massachusetts. Okay. Um, so, uh, I'm a food for service clinician, and social work is my trade. Yeah. But I'm also an emerging farmer. So, okay. you know, I have a lot of different, I have a lot of different pieces of skin in this particular game. So, um, and on my end, I wanted to learn more. Um, about the business side in terms of crafting a business plan, particularly to a food co-op in a very um, uh, low-income area yep. of Massachusetts. So I wanted to, instead of instead of trying to have an understanding of um, how it should look, how it should feel, who should be involved in the process, I'm focused on the business end. Um, so I'm really grateful for this perspective, and I'm wondering, um, you know, I tried to do an initial search on different benchmarks and food cooperatives, but unfortunately, the language doesn't jive. That's, that's going to be a hard the question is, um, just for the sake of the um, audio, um, question is that, uh, about benchmarks. Do they exist for food cooperatives or other sort of mission-driven businesses? Um, that's going to be tough because the, the challenge with a, creating a benchmark is you need to get um, enough comparable businesses that you can compare them together, you can merge them together. You need to get permission from the, you need to get the data, you know, not all... Most of the businesses we're talking about are small, privately held businesses. They're not publicly traded or anything like that. So there's no annual reports to just go to. You have to rely on the people to be forthwith coming on their financials. So it can be tough to put them together. And I think it's going to be hard to find a food cooperative benchmark, or, or one, uh, and especially one that's going to be useful in that it would be applicable to your enterprise. Um, um, at this stage of the game, I've been pretty much approaching co-ops individually. Yeah. I hope it's for it to evolve and building relationships that way because again you're, you're absolutely right they, they don't necessarily have to divide uh, yeah all of that information it's, it's it's there but it's it's very important what you're doing because um, one of the things that I like to say is that profitability doesn't need to be the only goal of your enterprise or even the primary goal um, you know oftentimes with mission driven businesses you're you know looking at community service or improving food access or whatever else but it's a prerequisite to achieving those other non-financial goals because if it's not profitable or if you're a 501c3, it's revenue in excess of expenses. <laughs> um, but if you're, if you're not you know, profitable in some fashion, it's not going to be sustainable over time. Um, you know, it needs to 
you need to pay the bills if you want to continue and achieve those other non-financial goals. So that's one thing that's often overlooked sometimes in the mission-driven um, business arena, um, but it's a very important one.